أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين المظلومين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة اللهم صل على محمد وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالم اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين for the hastening of the reappearance of the Master, the Savior, the Avenger, the Imam of the time. Al Hujjat ibn al Hassan al Askari recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If there is one fact in life that is undeniable after death, which is a universal law that applies to every single human being from the beginning of time to the end of time. وَقَهَرَ عِبَادَهُ بِالْمَوْتِ وَالْفَنَاءِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established a sunnah Divine Sunnah is a universal meta law. In other words, it's a law that applies to all the other laws. Other laws might have exceptions. Some people might be exempt from certain laws. But death is one of those things that applies universally across the board. It applies even to the greatest of prophets and messengers. But after death, one of the most undeniable facts of life is that everyone will be subjected to tests and trials. The reason is obvious because once we recognize the fact that we are in a world that was designed from the ground up to be a place for trials. When you go to the examination hall, 
That place was designed to have students come in, demonstrate their skills, their abilities, sit for these exams, and then it shows who put in the effort and who didn't. When you go to the DMV or to the motor registry office or whatever it's called in your country, to be tested on whether or not you can drive. The whole system is designed to be a place for testing the skills associated with that place. Once we recognize, and I want you to think about this, that this entire world, the lowly life, the dunya, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to it, is a place for us to be tested. Then what happens is that your approach, your perspective, your vantage point vis-a-vis -vis the tests will be altered dramatically. It'll be different. Someone who has no faith in a creator, someone who refuses to acknowledge the afterlife and the day of judgment and reckoning, compensation, remuneration, punishment, all these notions, once we reject them, suddenly these trials, these tests don't make any sense at all. And so the merest of difficulties and pains in this world could be, they become beyond not just comprehension, but beyond the capacity of the individual. If we're looking at things from a keyhole, you only see a small sliver of the reality that lies behind the door. And what happens is that your perspective is too narrow. You're not seeing the full picture. But when you believe in the Creator, and you believe in His revelation, and you believe in the afterlife, and you believe in the prophets and the messengers and the emissaries and the apostles who all came to say that this world, Daru Bala, it's a place that's designed for people to be tested. There were worlds that we went through prior to this one. And there are going to be worlds that we'll go through after this one. This is only a station, it's only a stop, it's only a layover. And that in this station you'll be tested. Once again, you see how the perspective changes quite drastically. And so, from the beginning of time until the day of judgment, these trials, these tests will never cease to exist. They'll always be there. They might come in different shapes and sizes. They might come in different levels of intensity. Sometimes these tests will be subjected to an entire community. Sometimes they'll be focused exclusively on one individual. Sometimes they'll affect our beliefs. Sometimes they'll affect our interests and our wealth and our physical bodies. So there is a full gamut of tests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed for this world. Establishing that fact allows you to then deal with them and to manage these tests in a manner that increases your chances of passing them. Once you know you're being tested, if you knew you had a camera pointed at you, recording your every move, the way you would deal, the way you would act, the way you would go about your life would be very different. If you knew someone was watching, if you knew your parents were watching, you would go about your life in a different way. You would be at your beha best behavior. You would do things that would be acceptable to the one observing you. That's how it works. Quite simple. And what's interesting is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this examination hall that we call the dunya. But he gave us so many cheat codes. First of all, he said, 
that you're being tested. So you're not being tricked. It's not a drill. You are going to be tested in this world. Number one. Number two, he sent prophet after prophet, 124,000 of them, each prophet with 12 successors. Do the math. All of these people, then the scholars, the people who preach to you what you're supposed to do, right? All of these people, their number one job is to tell you what to do to allow you to pass the test, right? Then he subjects you to certain trials that nudge you in the right direction and allow you to make the right choices. So it's full of cheat codes, which is why the famous hadith says, Ajibtu, I am amazed at the ones لِمَنْ هَلَكَ كَيْفَ هلك. They said to the Imam that Al-Hasan al-Basri, this charlatan, is saying, I'm amazed if anybody is able to go to paradise, that's a shock to me. Because we have so many rules and it's almost like walking on a landmine. The Imam said, he's a liar. That statement is erroneous, it's false. Rather, عَجِبْتُ لِمَنْ هَلَكَ كَيْفَ هلك. لِ I am amazed at the one who fails this test because Allah has made it so abundantly clear. He's given you all the answers. He's given you all the nudges that you need. He's given you all the signs, all the signals, all the guides, all the prophets. And so if you fail it, that's a surprise. And then on top of all that, given God's mercy, not just in this world, but also the next, if somebody ends up in the fires of hell, they're truly wretched, truly wicked. So the tests will come. No matter who you are, no matter what you do, no matter what kind of safety net you try to build for yourself, the trials will come. On an intellectual level and at the level of the community, think of all the tests that people went through at the time of Rasulullah. Then when the Holy Prophet was laid to rest, the trials that began after that, the confusion, the utter bewilderment that led so many people to turn their backs to the Prophet's own appointed successor. Amir al-Mu'mineen is completely deserted. His family is ambushed in their own home and people are just watching. That means the tests were difficult. A lot of people were too afraid. Some of them had their own interests and their own sort of uh, desires that they wanted to look after. But whatever the case was, the trials were extremely difficult. Then after Amir al-Mu'mineen, Muawiyah comes along, a guy that I wouldn't give the most menial job in the municipality to, suddenly becomes the leader of the entire Muslim nation. While Amir al muminin is there, how do you even compare the two? Qasuka Aba Hassanim Bisiwak, Wahal Bitawdi Yuqasu Dhar. How do they compare someone like Ali ibn Abi Talib to an animal like this and yet he gets the upper hand? He appoints himself as the leader of the nation and then he creates the most sophisticated propaganda machine that had been built in all of human history to churn out quotes and traditions in his favor. I'll give you one example which might shock all of you. In the book of Muslim, Sahih Muslim, there is a chapter with the following title. Honestly, it's so... Sad, it's hysterically funny. The chapter's title is this. Babu man la'anahu rasulullah aw sabbahu aw da'a alayh The chapter of those that Rasulullah has cursed or prayed against, invoked God's wrath upon that person 
وَهُوَ لَا يَسْتَحِقُّ ذَلِكَ Even though this person doesn't deserve to be cursed by Rasulullah. So Rasulullah would curse someone, but that person doesn't deserve it. فَتَكُونُ لَهُ رَحْمَةً وَرِفْعَةً When the Prophet does this to someone, the curses of Rasulullah are transformed into prayers for him. And Allah compensates this person by elevating his rank and raising his position. I mean, hot is cold, up is down, left is right. Anything goes in this fantastical fairy tale of a world. Rasulullah curses someone. Number one, that person doesn't deserve it. How could the Prophet curse someone when they don't deserve it? وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Isn't this in the Qur'an or is this from another sahih? Then, when Rasulullah curses someone, how could that person all of a sudden gain notoriety and status because the Prophet cursed him? So, if you think that's funny enough, the hadith that's mentioned in that chapter is rather famous. Rasulullah once sent somebody, a messenger, to go and call Muawiyah. Muawiyah is being summoned by the Holy Prophet. Muawiyah says to the messenger of Rasulullah that I'm too busy eating. Imagine the Prophet calls you. Imagine your mother, your aunt, your boss calls you, but you're like, no. I'm not even trying to come up with a justifiable, rational excuse. He's not even lying. He's like, I'm too busy eating. I'm sorry, I don't care what the Prophet says. The Prophet sends after him again. The Messenger of Allah is summoning you. No, I'm too busy eating. The third time the Messenger comes back, so Rasulullah curses him. And he says to him, لا أشبع الله له بطنة. May he never be satisfied from eating. Which is why they say that up until the end of his miserable life, Muawiyah would eat and eat and eat until his jaws didn't have the strength to keep on chewing the food and his stomach would get so big that the belly would fall sideways. The Prophet's prayer. So suddenly this incident which exposes Muawiyah for who he was, number one, someone who has absolute disregard to the orders of Rasulullah. And number two, someone who was cursed by the Prophet, they've placed this hadith under that chapter heading. In other words, Muawiyah didn't deserve to be cursed. And the fact that Rasulullah cursed him undeservedly means that Muawiyah's station and status will only elevate in the eyes of Allah. You see what I'm talking about? It's comical. But the test was difficult. And there might have been people who were too naive, too stupid, too gullible to actually digest all of this garbage. And there are up until this day. So the tests continued. Then it was time for Imam al Hassan, followed by Imam al Hussein one of the most difficult trials that the human race was subjected to was the massacre of Karbala. Imam al Hussein calling them to come, join him, support him. They don't. He's then massacred along with his family, butchered. Then the subsequent Imams. The trials in the time of Imam al-Sadiq for instance, were extremely difficult. The Imam, once again, there is miscon this mis misconception that the Imam lived at times of relative ease. No, he did not. You never see an incident where Imam al-Sadiq leads a congregational prayer, for example. You don't find that. But the Abbasids, they claim to be champions of knowledge and science. And so they began translating philosophical books as well as mystical texts, importing them from Persia, from India, from the Roman Empire. And they began this process where they tr uh, effectively tried to introduce the Muslim nation to so much filth and garbage and deviation with all of these 
philosophy works and mystical traditions. And so they had no choice but to allow the imam to simply speak to people and say, Qala Rasulullah. They had no choice. It's not that the imam lived at a time of comfort and ease and he was free to do whatever he wanted. So much, in fact, was the pressure at the time of the imam that when he passed away, the imam left a will in which he appointed not one, but five successors after him. In other words, the eyes of the tyrannical regime, the spies and the intelligence apparatus was out to try and find who the next imam would be, that the imam had to obscure his successor within this list, which included his wife, it included Mansur al-Dawaniqi himself, may Allah's eternal damnations be upon him. And that's what, in fact, led him to back off because when he issued the command to kill whoever's named in the imam's will, his name was found there. So were we going to, were we going to kill you as well? Abdullah al-Aftah, this, that. The point being that this gives you an, an idea of just how difficult the test was, which is why some of the companions, even the closest companions to the imam, didn't know who the next imam was going to be. Sure, there were traditions by the Holy Prophet, which meant, <coughs> excuse me, Sallu ala Muhammad. Then you come to the time of Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam. Imam al-Ridha, he, I mean, once again, imagine just how difficult those tests were. The Imam is the eighth in a sequence that should conclude with 12 Imams, right? And yet suddenly, the Imam is over 40 years old, 40 years old, but doesn't have a child. He doesn't have any offspring. And so chatter began to, began to spread. What's going to happen? If Imam al-Ridha is someone who uh, is infertile, if he cannot have any children, what's going to happen to the other Imams? We've been told that there are 12 of them. And so people in the time of Imam al-Ridha, specifically there were two individuals who had gotten so close to Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al kadhim that they had built a reputation for themselves. They were respected by the Shia. They were the ones who came out and said that no, there are only seven Imams. They became the leaders of the Waqifiyya movement. Incidentally, there is a hadith where they ask the Imam about these individuals, the splinter groups and their leaders, the Waqifiyya, and they say to them, what about these What's going to happen to them? The Imam said that they will die and then Allah will replace them by others. In other words, the trials have to go on. Even when those deviant ones leave this world, they'll be replaced. And they were replaced up until this very day. You have imposters, you have charlatans, and we talked about that previously. The point is, that when they realize the imam doesn't have a son, they try to take advantage of the opportunity and keep the religious dues that they had in their possession, the khums and zakat and whatnot, which was in the millions. And so they came out with this fabrication, this lie, that Imam al-Rada is not an imam. The last imam was Imam Musa ibn Ja'far and he ascended to the heavens. He didn't even die. He's still alive. And so the Shia began becoming increasingly concerned if Imam al-Ridha doesn't have any children. And the Imam kept telling them, wait, wait. You have to have patience. You can't jump the gun. People need to be tested. Otherwise, why do you think this happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have made everything hunky-dory, everything's by the 
book and each imam followed by the next. The Prophet could have had his son become the next, the first imam, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have made Ibrahim, for instance, or Al Qasim, or any of the Prophet's children who died when they were young in infancy. They could become the imams, and so no one would dispute it because, after all, this is the Prophet's son. But no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala twists the facts just a little bit, just to be complex enough so that it constitutes a test. If it was too obvious, it wouldn't be a test anymore, would it? And so instead of the Prophet's son, he appoints his cousin. Instead of his son, it's his son-in-law. Instead of his son, it is his, his nafs. وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ Right? And so, then the Imam would say to his followers that you need to wait, have a little bit more patience. Until finally Imam al-Jawad a.s. is born. Was that the end of the discord? The end of the test? No. Because there were people who said that is... Imagine the oppression, the pain of Imam al Rida. They said, This is not Imam al Rida's son. His complexion is too dark. It was almost black. They said, That can't possibly be his son. Some of the Imam's family members came to him and said, We need to address this. People are talking, people are saying, That's not your son. What do we do? And we've thought about it and we decided, imagine, they're speaking about Imam al Rida and his son. They said, we put some thought into it and we think the best approach is to go and bring four genealogists, people who at the time had the required level of expertise. They could look at someone and immediately say that this child is this person's son. And not just one, but four of them from far-flung places, from different parts of the nation. Sure enough, they went and brought these four people. They each looked at Imam al-Jawad, this newborn. And they looked at all of the people who, were ga who had gathered there. They told Imam al-Rida to go in to some farm which was close to them, but to not sit with them. So these gene genealogists, they look at these faces and they say that this boy is not the son of any of you sitting here. The second one said the same thing. The third one said the same thing. The fourth one said, look, none of you is this boy's father. If this boy's father is here, then it's that person who's farming in that farm. Even though he didn't see the imam's face, he said, I recognize him from his legs. That's the boy's father. And so they came and said, Alhamdulillah, we resolved this crisis. We fixed the problem. Now we know for a fact. Imagine! So the tests and the trials were incredibly difficult. They were daunting. Every day someone new comes up, makes a new declaration, a new claim, and then you have to address it and you have to respond to it. It's so easy to make people doubt things, isn't it? So easy. How easy is it to discredit somebody's reputation? Hey, you know this car? I saw him, this person, I saw him driving a fancy car the other day. There's no way he's making that much money. I'm sure he's doing something on the side. I'm sure he's not paying taxes. I'm sure he's dealing drugs. It's so easy to make the claim. But then responding to it is a whole other matter. You'd have to come and say, no, this is who I am. This is my job. This is how much money I make. You have to lay out an entire case whereas simply making a claim that casts the seeds and plants the seeds of doubt into people's hearts is so easy. And that's what the imams had to deal with. Then when you come to the time of Imam al-Jawad imagine an imam who's only nine years old. Nine. Which by the way, I did a whole video on this in which I... Talk about the fact that Imam al-Jawad's age is what destroys the argument that claims the imams of the Ahlul Bayt were never appointed by Allah and rather they were simply righteous good scholars. Because when you have a nine-year-old 
who exudes knowledge and light and who debates the foremost experts in the scientific disciplines of the day and absolutely shatters them, makes them acknowledge that they know nothing compared to this child. Obviously, this can't be the product of, a, of, of the child's education. They say that when the, Buddha, when the Dalai Lama is appointed, they often do so when this person is really young. And so what they do is they take him and they put him in a bubble. No one sees him for the next 20 years, 30 years. While they train the poor kid and they teach him and they educate him. Because if he simply comes out as a child and someone asks him a question that he so obviously has no answer to, what's going to happen? It'll expose the fact that this person is a nobody, is just a child. But no, if you want to believe if you want to make people believe that this person has been reincarnated with the spirit of the Buddha, then you have to play these tricks. Whereas Imam al-Jawad as a nine-year-old came, challenged everyone, and everyone succumbed to his superiority. Then the next Imam came, Imam al-Hadi, and he was only eight years old. I mean, the tests are getting more intense. Think about it. Then the 12th Imam is crowned and he's only five years old. And if that wasn't difficult enough, he goes into occultation. And if the occultation, the minor occultation, wasn't difficult enough for people to, to bear, after that begins the greater occultation. And you have to believe that he's still alive because of all of these verses, because of all of these hadith, because of all of these logical arguments, the point I'm making is that the intensity of the tests kept getting higher and higher and higher. And we know for a fact, brothers and sisters, that as the end of days approaches, as the reappearance of the 12th Imam gets closer, the intensity of the tests will only grow, what? Higher. And so it's terrifying. It's scary. But bear a few things in mind. Number one, there's a hadith where they come to Imam al-Sadiq and they said to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, with all of these trials, with all of these tests, what's going to happen to us in the time of the occultation? So the Imam was in a tent. He lifted the tent or removed it and pointed to the sun. He said, what's that? They said, that's the sun. He said, are you sure that's the sun? He said, yeah, obviously it's the sun. The imam said, are you sure? They said, yes. The imam said, listen, those tests will be as clear as the sun. In other words, the knowledge that you possess today, the information that you have, the belief system that we have built, having accumulated the knowledge of all of the previous generations going all the way back to Rasulullah is a lot greater than many of the companions of the Imams had. As I said earlier, some of the companions were not aware of certain things because of taqiyya, because the Imams didn't share everything with everyone. They would share certain things with one companion, uh, a set of things with, a, with another companion. And it took a long time before, say, the time of Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari, where the Imams actually began to speak more clearly. And they began to divulge information and knowledge and gnosis about divine authority, about the status and rank of the Ahlul Bayt that could not be so easily shared in the time of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq. If you read Ziyarat al-Jama'ah, which is narrated by Imam al-Hadi alayhi salatu wasalam, you'll find that the Imam is saying things that you could find hints about in the traditions and teachings of the previous Imams, but not like this. Not in its holistic manner. And not with this kind of depth. Things began to change.
And so accumulating all of this knowledge, we now possess a much clearer picture about our beliefs. Alhamdulillah. Had we been in the time of Amir al muminin had we been in the time of Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein, and so on, the test would have been a lot more difficult. Now things are a lot more clear. Now we have a global community. Now we have the event of Ashura where hundreds upon hundreds of millions of people commemorate the tragedy of Imam al Hussein openly and freely. This is a new thing, brothers and sisters. It's a novel thing. Never in our history did we have so much power, so much freedom. Let's seize it. Let's take advantage of all of this. Educate ourselves, educate our families, establish institutions, build schools, help keep our families and our children on the right path. Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. What a great blessing this is. Rasulullah says that I yearn for my brothers. The companions say, aren't we your brothers? The Prophet said, no. They'll be the people who will believe in ink on paper. They've never seen me. They've never seen my family. But they see the facts printed. They see the hadiths. They see the proofs and they believe in them. Alhamdulillah. So keep that in mind. That as hard and intense and as difficult as it's going to get, we have all the facts on our side. We have the institutions. We have the ulama. We have the scholars, the righteous, godly, erudites of our faith to guide us and to help us navigate through this maze and this minefield. So, these are all the intellectual tests that will continue. But also I want to say a few words about some of the personal trials that we all go through. Because I've been getting a lot of messages, a lot of questions. Again, in my life as a slave, in, inshallah, I would be accepted as a slave of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. I've met so many people, so many communities around the world. And this is one of those recurring themes that I get all the time. Which is, why the trials? Why the difficulties? Why the pain? Somebody said to me the other day, I lost my father and I lost my trust in God. How do I regain that trust? So that person's on the right track. They're actually here in the Majlis of Imam al Hussein. They're asking this question. They want to know. They want to be guided. But the fact that some people might lose their faith in God because of a tragedy, this is something that we see. How do we address it? I want to read you some narrations that are incredibly insightful on this matter. Abu Sabah was someone who came to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam and he asked him a question, something that you all find yourself asking at one point. He said to him, مَا أَصَابَ الْمُؤْمِنَ مِنَ الْبَلَاءِ أَفَبِذَنْبٍ when a believer gets tried, is that because of a sin they've committed? The Imam says, La, no. If the person is a believer, then the trials they're subjected to are not based on sins and transgressions. But rather, it's because Allah wants to hear this person moan. This person reach out to him. لِيَسْمَعَ اللَّهُ أَنِينَهُ وَشَكْوَاهُ وَلِيَكْتُبْ لَهُ الْحَسَنَاتُ وَيُحِطَّ عَنْهُ السَّيِّعَاتُ It is so that Allah elevates his rank and forgives his sins. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ Listen to this part. Surely Allah لَيَعْتَذِرُ إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ الْمُؤْمِنْ كَمَا يَعْتَذِرُ الْأَخْوَ إِلَىٰ أَخِيهِ Allah is so merciful that he will apologize to his believing slave the way a brother apologizes to his brother. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has nothing to apologize for. Even though Allah doesn't owe anyone anything. And yet, what the imam is saying is that he will treat this person in a manner as though he's apologizing to him. Inna Allah 
لا يعتذر إلى عبده المؤمن كما يعتذر الأخ إلى أخيه فيقول الله says to this person on the day of judgment لا وعزتي ما أفقرتك لهوانك عليه I swear by my glory I didn't make you poor I didn't make you destitute I didn't make you go through this trial because you're worthless to me It's not because I don't care about you Then he says to him فرفع هذا الغطاء Lift this veil Something Allah has prepared for him on the day of judgment, lift it and look what's inside. Fayakshiv, the believer lifts the veil. Fayanburu fi awadih. He will see his compensation. He will see the reward that Allah is giving him in exchange for those trials. Fayakul ma dharrani ya rabbi ma zawayta anni. Oh Allah, I lost nothing in the dunya. The trials, the pains, I lost nothing of those given what you are offering me now. Then the Imam says, وَمَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ قَوْمًا إِلَّا ابْتَلَاهُمْ Whenever Allah loves a group, He tries them. He tests them. وَإِنَّ عَظِيمَ الْأَجْرِ مَعَ عَظِيمَ الْبَلَاءِ Because the greatest rewards, the greatest accomplishments are only derived from the greatest of tests and trials. Which is why one of the reasons we go through trials is that trials and tests are the greatest badge of honor. Because Allah only tries His believing servants the most. We have hadiths that the Holy Prophet, for instance, is famous for saying, أَشَدُّ النَّاسِ بَلَاءً Those with the greatest tests are who? الأنبياء ثم الأولياء ثم الأمثل فالأمثل It's the prophets then their successors and godly saints then whoever is closest to them. It's a badge of honor. Imam Al-Hasan Al-Askari says ما من بلية إلا ولله فيها نعمة تحيط بها Every test every difficulty you go through every single one is surrounded by a blessing that comes along with it. That's the silver lining. You don't know what blessing this trial is going to bring you, but there's always one there. If you're going through too many trials, it's because you're a believer. It's because this world is a prison for the believer, as the hadith says. الكافر, and a paradise for the disbeliever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't care about them. That's why they're so happy. In fact, there's a hadith which says that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up a gate toward the dunya for you, you should be afraid. You should be worried. When something really good happens. You know how people react when something special happens, when they enjoy an event or an accomplishment or some kind of milestone? They say, let's go celebrate. It's no cause for celebration. Number two, the reason we go through these trials, and I want to wrap this up quickly, is that they are a means of ascension, a means of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen to this hadith. The Holy Prophet says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَيُغَذِّ عَبْدَهُ الْمُؤْمِنَ بِالْبَلَاءِ كَمَا تُغَذِّ الْوَالِدَةُ وَلَدَهَا بِالْلَبَنِ Allah feeds and nourishes his believing servant with trials and tests the way a mother nurses her child with breast milk. If you leave a child without his mother's breast milk, what, breast milk what's going to happen? The child will die or they'll be malnourished. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you these trials for your own good and they keep coming. They keep coming. Then the Prophet says, وَإِنَّ الْبَلَاءَ إِلَى الْمُؤْمِنَ أَسْرَعْ مِنَ السَّيْلِ إِلَى الْوَادِ And trials head towards believers faster than floods going inside a valley. They're always there. There's always something, always something that bothers you. Whether it's your business, your work, your career, your family, your house, your mortgage, this, that. There's always something. 
But it's a badge of honor. And it's a means of reaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, and I'll conclude with this. We'll probably leave the rest for tomorrow. It is a means of reward. It's a means of thawab. As we said in the first hadith, but I'll mention a couple more. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ إِذَا أَحَبَّ عَبْدًا غَتَّهُ بِالْبَلَاءِ غَتَّهُ when Allah loves someone, He submerges that person in trials. The way you would submerge something in water. Then the Imam says, فَإِذَا دَعَاهُ If this person who's being tried and tested prays to Allah, supplicates, turns to Him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَبَّيْكَ abdi." My servant, I'm at your beck and call. I'm here for you. لَبَّيْكَ عَبْدِي لَإِنْ عَجَّلْتُ لَكَ مَا سَأَلْتُ If I give you what you're asking for quickly and immediately, فَإِنِّي عَلَى ذَلِكَ لَقَادِرُ I'm more than capable of doing that. وَلَكِنْ أَخَّرْتُ ذَلِكَ وَلَكِنْ إِدَّخَرْتُ لَكَ فِي مَدْ but I wish to compensate you with something that matures later on. I'll give you something later on, but it's way better for you than simply giving your wish, granting your wish to you right now. Having this kind of worldview, understanding that bala Difficulties, trials, pains are a means of ascension, a means of gaining proximity to Allah, a means of being rewarded by Allah. Making this philosophy part and parcel of your worldview means that not only will you not complain about trials, but you'll be grateful. You'll be thankful to Allah. And you will see every trial as an opportunity to excel. So whatever comes your way, you don't care. You're like, thank you. Oh Allah, you care about me, which is why you're testing me. If you didn't care, you'd be like, you know what, go do whatever you want. You care. So thank you for that. Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. Which is why God's emissaries, when they were faced with trials, what do they do? They exhibited patience. And even rida is the first level to, to be pleased. Or rather the first level is to be patient. Then it is to be pleased with what you have, with what Allah has decreed for you. Then above that, there are also many levels. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tried Ibrahim and he said to him, you have to slaughter your son. He went to his son Ismail and he said to him, Ya bunayya inni ara fil manami anni adhbahuk. I've been commanded through my dream. Revelation to the Prophet used to come through dreams. And I've been commanded to slaughter you. Qala ya abati fa'al ma tu'mar. Father, do what you've been commanded to do. Satajiduni, inshallah. Min as You'll find me patient. I'll do my best. Falamma aslama wa tallahu lil jabeen. When they were ready to do this, the Quran says Ibrahim came and he put his son's head on the ground. He put his forehead on the ground, ready to be slaughtered. وَنَادَيْنَاهُ أَيَّا إِبْرَاهِيمُ قَدْ صَدَّقْتَ الرُّؤْيَا إِنَّا كَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Stop, Ibrahim, stop. You have fulfilled your obligation. And this is how we compensate the good servants of Allah. Don't do this. Why? Allah then explains in the next verse. He says that this is بَلَاءُ mubin. This was the manifest trial, the epitome of trials, the most difficult of trial. Why? May Allah 
never try any of our believing brothers and sisters, the lovers of Ali ibn Abi Talib with this test. That you don't have a child, then Allah gives you a child. فَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِغُلَامٍ حَلِيمٍ Not just any child, but a forbearant one, a righteous one, a respectful one, a pious one. We gave him this child, then the child grows until the Quran says, وَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ السَّعِي He was old enough to go about his father's business with him. In other words, he's not just two years old, he's not five or six, he's now 17, 18, 19 years of age. He becomes his father's assistant. He shadows his father wherever he goes. For this boy, for this son, to then be killed, the Quran says, Bala'un Mubin. This is the most difficult thing a person could go through. And so, on the eve of Ashura, Imam al Hussein tells all of his companions and family members, he says to them, Use the darkness of this night. Leave. Each one of my companions should hold the hand of one of my family members and simply walk away. Leave me with only one person, my son Ali al Akbar. Imam al Hussein is here in Karbala to offer a great sacrifice, a sacrifice like no other. The dearest thing to him was being offered in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, the Imam says, you should all leave. I just want my son Ali al-Akbar with me. Imam al Hussein wanted to send his son before anybody else. Had it not been for the fact that the companions of Aba Abdullah refused to let any one of his family members head into battle before they were all killed, Ali al-Akbar would have been the first martyr on Ashura. And so as soon as the last of the companions was slain, Ali al-Akbar came towards his father. Father, will you give me permission to go and fight? The hadith describes Imam al Hussein like this. He says, He looked at his son, he gave him a gaze of someone who has lost all hope in his son. Then the Imam cried and lifted his blessed head towards the heavens and said the following Allahumma shhad ala ha il qawm. فقد برز إليهم غلام أشبه الناس خلقا وخلقا ومنطقا برسولك A young man has emerged who has the greatest resemblance to your prophet in his appearance his manners and his speech. Whenever we yearned for your messenger, we would look at this young boy. We all know the relationship between Imam Al Hussein and Rasulullah. And so when the Imam says, whenever I yearned for your prophet, it means he was always looking at his son Ali al Akbar. Ajarakumullah ya mu'mineen. Ali al Akbar headed into the battlefield. He began fighting. Allah only knows what Abba Abdullah's heart was going through. Knowing that his son was surrounded by 30,000 wolves trying to kill him, knowing that he resembled Rasulullah. 
their war was against Rasulullah. Aba Abdullah was waiting, hoping maybe, just maybe, Aniyul Al Akbar will make it, even though he was hopeless. After a while, Aliyun Al Akbar managed to kill over a hundred of them and send them to hell. Then came back to his father, Allahu Akbar. Aliyun Al Akbar comes back to give his father some comfort. But this is his excuse. He says to him, these are my words. He says to him, Father, I'm fighting them. I reminded them of the courage of Ali ibn Abi Talib in the battle. My father, there is nothing for you to worry about. But you know one thing, I won't die at their hand. If I will be killed, it is because I'm thirsty. Aba, 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 in the Lata Shakat Katalani, Wathiklal Hadid Kadaj Hazani. My father, I can't bear the thirst anymore. What does Imam Al Hussein say to him? This breaks the heart. Aba Abdullah says to him, Mahiya illa sa'a wa yasqika jadduka rasulullah bi ka'si al awfa. La tadma'u ba'daha abada. My son, it's only a matter of time before your grandfather quenches your thirst with his eternal cup after which you will never feel thirst again. In other words, Imam al Hussein is saying to his boy, the only way you're going to be quenched is if you die. Ali al Akbar then heads back into the battlefield once again, fighting with valor and courage. When a wicked, wretched man approaches him, he strikes him on the head with his sword. Rahim Allah man nada wa aliya wa gariba wa mazluma. Aliyun al Akbar places his head on his steed. The blood is gushing from his head. It covers the horse's eyes. Instead of the horse taking him back to his camp, it takes him straight into the heart of the enemy camp. They attacked him from all directions. He called out. Imagine Abu Abdullah is hoping his son would return. Suddenly he hears his son Ali. Abu alayka bin salam. Father, salam upon you. Hada jaddi Rasulullah. Qad saqani bi kasih al-awfa. Alladhi la adma'u ba'dahu abada. Father, don't worry about me anymore. My grandfather's quenched my thirst, and he has a message for you. He says, There is a cup waiting for you, O oh Father. Aba Abdullah al Hussein rushes towards his boy. Some have said, instead of the Imam disembarking from his horse, Rama bin Afsihi ala walad, he threw himself over his son's body. He sat next to him, Bunaya Ali. Bunaya Ali. على الدنيا بعدك العفا أما أنت فقد استرحت من هم الدنيا وغمها My boy Ali, you're now relieved from the pains of this world but you left me all alone على الدنيا بعدك العفا Imam al Hussein began crying out loud such that he had not been seen crying up until that moment. Suddenly, Lady Zainab came out of the tent. Wa Aliyah! 
وأخاه وابن أخاه Imam Al Hussein was distracted by his sister Zainab. He says, "Sister, go back to the tent. Zainab saved the life of Abu Abdullah. She saved him from dying for his son." Then Imam Al Hussein called the other members of Bani Hashim. He said, "Come and help me carry Ali back to the tent." I ask you, Ya Mu'mineen, Imam Al Hussein carried. Al Qasim, Imam Al Hussein carried others. Why does he need help with Ali ibn Al Akbar? Ajarak Allah, Baqiyat Allah, because they have said that when he went back to the enemy, فقطعوه إرابا إرابا. He says, رحب الله من نادى ثلاثا حسين. 